turn on my mic. I've been talking and you haven't been able to see anything, hear anything. It's been a while. Okay, so let's recap. Um, quick recap for everything that you could not hear. Hello, hello. I'm just going to start saying this again. And hopefully you can now just fast forward to this. I'll put a timestamp in there. So that way, if you're watching this later on YouTube, hopefully you're watching this now. Anyway, so I have basically, if you've caught at the end of the last video, which I didn't export to YouTube because it was kind of weird, but um, I'm not doing right now Thursday ink reviews regularly anymore. That's because I got a new gig, substitute teaching at a local school system for high school. And that means I have to be up at 4.30 in the morning. Being up at 4.30 in the morning is not conducive to doing a couple hours of ink review streaming at the end of a work week. And I'm just, I was too exhausted, too frazzled to actually do anything. It... Yeah, that's why I was just like, we're just gonna let this settle out. However, today I had appointments and stuff in the morning, which meant I couldn't sub, which means I am together enough to do one of these reviews. I am done with all my diamine shimmer inks. So we are done with those, we're finally done with those. And we have today is Pelican Edelstein Star Ruby. Star Ruby is the ink of the year. Pelican does this every year. I have or I got this bottle at the Pelican Hub about a month ago. It, I have already inked it up in this pen, in my pens, because they still had, the last inks I had in there were Diamond Shimmer inks, so I wanted to clear out some of the, I wanted to ink them up and do a bunch of scribbling, get the rest of that shimmer out of the feed, so that way I could have it all look nice and pretty for you and properly represent the ink. Don't want you to see any stray shimmer. The reason I had this bottle out was because I was comparing it to Lamy Vibrant Pink. This is Lamy Vibrant Pink. It was the limited edition Lamy ink in 2018. It does has, have these shimmer particles down here. It does have a low key shimmer in it. So if you have a bottle of this, make sure to shake it up before you ink because it does have like flake like shimmer versus particle like shimmer. Not the case here. Similar ish colorway, but not quite the case. So let's look at the swab. In here somewhere. There we are. Yes, it's with my bright, like reddish pinks. Hey, Rewell. So I have it sandwiched between Savage's Carmine and Colorverse Redshift. It's actually color. It's actually really similar to Colorverse Redshift, at least on the swabs. I have not written with anything yet. Colorverse Redshift has a bit more of a sheen, but there's still some sheen here. Yes, so Rebel's referencing this pen on Monday night, or no, Tuesday night. I went to go clean it, and it decided to jump down the sink drain, so I had to take apart my sink to retrieve this pen. It's working fine. I've inked it up since. Um, probably because there's so much gunk in the sink or something, it cushioned the fall, but, and I got it out right away. But yeah, it's fine. So yeah, I'm like it to me, to my eye, this looks very similar to Colorverse Redshift. We'll compare it in writing samples because I've had quite a few inks that look real similar in the swabs, but then you start writing with them and you can really start seeing the color differences because you can see the differences in saturation and everything in the stroke of the pen. So we'll, we'll do that. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm like looking for my stuff and I realized I had moved it because it's been like a month. I have it all in my Nutco Lanier, which I love this bag. I don't like the pouch that came with it. So I sold that to a friend, but the actual briefcase I really enjoy. Works really well for me. Probably one of the less popular knock cases. Oh right, the piece of paper is in there. Okay. Yeah, and as you can see, like I said, I've still been doing reviews. So I've been doing them during the day while I've been just chilling, minding the students. But yeah, so let's turn. There, it was a little bit aggressive. Cool. There we are, little pencil. Okay. 
And Rebel, you missed the fact that I forgot to turn on my mic. So I did a whole intro spiel for like three, four minutes before I realized it was off. This is what happens when you don't stream for like a month. Okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to get... There's... There we go. I was looking for... I was like, I had picked out a article. But I was like, what window? Because I have so many tabs open. I forgot how many tabs I always have open when I do these things. Just to monitor all the things. Okay. And this ink is going to seem probably unusually wet to me, at least in this pen right now, because the basically last rash of inks for like the last month and a half that I've been using have all been shimmer inks. And this pen does not get along very well with shimmer inks. At best, it feels dry. At worst, it clogs. So now I'm just like, oh, look, it's writing. This is a miracle. <gasps> Unfortunately, there weren't very many good or entertaining, well, not good, but like entertaining articles in the paper today. Last week, because I've been continuing to write the ink reviews, just not on a stream because I don't know, haven't had time. But there was one on Murder Kroger. I love Murder Kroger. I've never actually been in Murder Kroger because by the time I figured out where it was, they were, they had knocked it down in order to build a fancy new one because the neighborhood it's in is gentrifying. Murder Kroger is called Murder Kroger because a murder occurred in that Kroger in 1991. So a while ago, it's enough for, you know, neighborhood to change and everything. So it's no longer a very murdery neighborhood. It's now a very hipster neighborhood. But we will still call it Murder Kroger. It is just now new Murder Kroger. They keep trying to rebrand it. They're like, it's the Beltline Kroger now. It's like, no, it's Murder Kroger. What are you doing? But yeah, so they, because they wanted to build like a mixed use thing where there's like apartments on top or something of the Kroger. It's like not a standalone building. It's like part of a development or something because gentrifying. They're like, well, we're going to knock it down. So this is a chance to rebrand. And so there hasn't, Murder Kroger has not existed for the past couple of years. But now it's back. Grocery store nicknames are the best. For some reason, it's always the Kroger's that get, at least in Atlanta, the Kroger's that have nicknames. The Publixes don't really have nicknames. And not all the public, and not all the Kroger's have nicknames. It's just a couple of them. Like, there's one Kroger that's really tiny because apparently it was like a local grocery store or something. So it's not, it's called Baby Kroger because it's, you know, it's like half the size of a regular Kroger. There's one that is in a still really rough neighborhood that's called Ghetto Kroger. And that's like, mm. there's the one that's in the Orthodox Jewish neighborhood that's called Crozier. Sorry, I'm pouring myself some tea.
There's obviously Murder Kroger. That's the most infamous one. There's also Disco Kroger. Disco Kroger is called Disco Kroger because it is in a former disco. Like it used to be a club and then they turned it into a Kroger. And I think, I haven't been in there, but apparently the original like disco linoleum floor is still like they didn't change it. And I think there might still be a disco ball hanging from the ceiling or maybe like you could see the fixture for it. I haven't looked this up in a while. Those are at least the most infamous local Kroger's. Dixie, okay. It may be because Kroger, at least I noticed more than Publix, and in Atlanta, actually really changes what they stock depending on the neighborhood. Like Kroger gives, or Kroger corporate gives the local store managers a lot more leeway in what they stock at least compared to Publix. Because all the Publixes I've been in have had roughly, have had pretty much the same stock, doesn't change from Publix to Publix, versus the Kroger stocks really, you can, like, it's a different store. They may or may not have the thing you're looking for. The basics they still have, but a lot of selection is very different depending on which Kroger you go to. So the orange Lamy ink is next. Right now I'm doing two inks. Um, right now I'm doing Pelican Edelstein Star Ruby. I'm gonna do Lamy next. I'm basically doing them in the order that I acquired them. It's not really a science to them. But yeah, so we'll get there. Also, I don't think I've seen you here before or something on paper. I feel like I've seen you around somewhere. I don't know if it's in Brad's stream or on Slack or somewhere, but hi. Um, I used to do these regularly weekly, but then I got a well, new additional second job. And so I haven't been able to do these in the last month or so. Um, where was I in there? Ah, yes. So yeah, so up until like a month ago, I was doing basically reviewing two weeks a week, two weeks a week on a live stream every week. Right now it's a little bit in flux. Today is I happen to be able to do it. So I decided to come back and do it. But so what I do is I'm actually writing the ink reviews of like that I will then scan and post to my blog. So this is, you're literally just watching me write the reviews and getting my feedback in real time. I really like doing this. It's a way to hang out. And then I get distracted. Okay. Unlivable state. And what I'm copying and was talking to Redwell about is articles from my local paper. I'm not talking about the one I'm copying because it's more something about derelict neighborhoods and buildings. That's sort of exciting, but I was copying one earlier or a cup like a couple days ago about the beloved murder Kroger. But yeah, this is Pelican Edelstein star Ruby. You, if you know about Pelican hubs, this is something you could have gotten at Pelican hubs. It also takes me a while to do these because I'm like trying to talk and write at the same time and that kind of works.
But Pelican does the inks of the year. And this is the one they had this year. And I got it at the Pelican Hub. Pelican Hubs are basically Pelican-sponsored pen meets that happen at the end of September every year. And they give inks in a goodie bag. And they basically give you a free ink as swag. It's great. So I just like get the bottle of Pelican every year. It's nice. Oh, yeah. So I got the email. Like I'm on several pen shops newsletter list. I got the email that had the 4 a.m. sailor from Bromfield Pen Shop in Boston. My brother lives in Boston, so I stop in at Bromfield frequently when I visit him. Um, and they, oh, they had the 4 a.m. sailor and I was like, oh no, that looks really terrible, at least in their promo pick. But then Toasty Treat posted that on Slack and I was like, oh, that's way prettier. I still don't like the mismatching nib and hardware, but it looks way better. Like, I thought the acrylic looked terrible in the stock photos. But in Toasty Treat's photo, it was a lot darker. And it looked a lot better. That's the case, though, with sailors. It seems like the stock photos always look real bad until you see one in person. Then you're like, oh. Play where I... This is why these always take forever. So, yeah. Yeah, when I'm doing these, when I'm not, while not streaming, I get them done in like half an hour. Each one. And then it takes like 45 minutes to an hour to do it while I'm streaming because I'm chatting. And then I lose my place in the article. This ink is super wet, and I really like how wet and smooth it is. That's what she said. There's just so many that's what she said moments with pen stuff. It's kind of ridiculous. And then the fact that pretty much all the pen podcasts are extremely PG is just really funny. Because you just miss all the innuendo opportunities. So yeah, this... Yeah, I don't know. And it's not just Sailor. I don't know, because like, all the photos are starting to look more and more like Goulet photos. Which, Goulet takes really good photos, but they also have a tendency to really overexpose it or something. Or like the colors are washed out. And everyone is emulating that style. And it's leading to some weird, or not of, color representation. Some inks are more susceptible, or inks, inks and pens are more susceptible to that offness than others. And I've started to distrust a lot of product photos for pens, but especially for inks, because everyone's getting a lot better at doing their swabs, but I find a lot of the swabs, like they're going the more towards the dump ink on the page route which isn't necessarily representative of how it looks like in writing. Hence, I do these reviews. I always look for writing samples. So that's why my reviews lean heavily on writing samples. Um, yeah, this has a, I was gonna say shimmer, but that's, that's left over from the previous inking. It's got, it's like it's trying to sheen. Like I can see something is weird about the edges in the wet pen. It's not like, oh, it's sheen, but I can tell there's something going on there a little bit extra. Let me get up the swab again, which honestly corresponds to the swab. There's like a little bit of sheen right there. 
that is not coming through on the camera, but just trust me, it's there. It should come through in the actual scans. And but it's like just a hint. And so that's what I think is coming through here. You don't really see it in these two in the wet and dry flow inks. But it's there. Um, let's actually flip back and compare it to Colorverse Redshift because that's what it looks most like. Now if I can remember where Colorverse Redshift is in all this. I think it was after that. Yeah, this is where I played with stuff in San Francisco. Uh, that's all my San Francisco inks from last year. Where is Colorverse Redshift? There it is. So Colorverse Redshift has a w more obvious sheen. This is much pinkier than Redshift. So while they look real similar in the swabs, this guy is much more red with a hint of, with a red that leans pink, and this is more a pink that leans red, if that makes sense. So let's do it on another paper. Because while I love to the Tomoe River, for some reason it doesn't tend to show, at least the stuff that's in the hippo doesn't show off the ink properties as well for my own use. I Kakuyo tends to be what I use to evaluate the inks for their actual performance and how they'll look to me when I actually use them later on. Okay. Where'd the itty bitty pencil go? I put it down somewhere. Seriously, where did I put it? It's not in my jar. Oh, it's right here. Blind, I tell you. Okay. I love this Kikuyo paper. I've been advocating Kikuyo paper for years since I first discovered it. And people are just now in the last six months to a year. Like, I don't know, it's finally gotten through their consciousness. And everyone's like, oh yeah, Kikuyo. And I'm like, yeah, see, I was telling you, it was good shit. Probably because Daryl gave his backing to Kikuyo. And I mean, fair. You should listen to Daryl when it comes to paper recommendations because he knows his stuff. If you don't know who Daryl is, Daryl is the person behind Masubi, Mas Masubi Notebooks. And he, so he, yeah, those are really high quality books. And you should just go to their website um, to get that story because they tell it better than I do. But Daryl also used to work in the Japanese paper industry, which is why he can pull strings and get all sorts of bonkers papers for their notebooks for limited runs because he, he, he's been in the industry. He knows all the inside people. And so because he knows all this and he's also a stationary nerd, he will just like come in on Slack and be like, hey, here's this random paper. You should, guys should all try it. But yeah, Kikuyo, because it's not quite as coated as Rhodia. It still has got some smooth coating, which I, that's, I personally like that. But got a little bit more tooth it's got all the fun rulings and it's got pretty darn good performance I'm particularly fond of the the rule that is in these notebooks which is dotted line so it's a line notebook I actually kind of like line notebooks as long as the lines aren't too widely spaced. It's six millimeter lined, which is ideal. And the dots allow you to line things up and space things, which is what I don't like about lined normally is that you can't do that easily. Here you can because of the dots. It's just so ideal. I love it. 
Japanese man. They know what they're talking about. There's something about that difference between seven millimeter and six millimeter rule that just really helps my handwriting. Though my handwriting is not too hot today. Don't know why. I've been really cold all day, which is a sign I don't have a fever, but it's like 72 in my apartment, so it shouldn't be freezing cold. And usually that's a sign that either I'm getting sick, which I'm not getting sick, I took a, like I don't have a fever, I'm hungry, or I'm tired. Because that's how my body reacts to stress, is by making myself freezing. So I ate food, still kind of cold, so that means I'm probably tired. I not got enough sleep last night. I think it's holdover from Tuesday. On Tuesday, I basically worked from 6.30 to 8 p.m. with maybe an hour and a half break in there. So, yeah. And that involved also getting up at 4 in the morning. So, not 4 in the morning, 4.30 in the morning. So different. So I think my body is still trying to get me to recover from that. Mm -hmm. I just realized I should correct. Like I said, I have the autofocus. Like, it has autofocus, this camera, but it doesn't play well with the stationary, like, stationary for some reason. Like, if I did this on autofocus, it would focus in and out, and then it would land on something that's out of focus. It's incredibly frustrating, so I have it on manual. But I'll forget to switch it between the slightly different distances. It also, for some reason, really struggles with color accuracy in this desk mode. So in Ink Dependence Mike has this same camera for his, actually built for both his cameras, and it's fine in just this normal view, and then the desk down, it just struggles with color correctness. I have mastered it enough such that between the settings on the camera and I've got this newer LED light that I can change the color settings from cool to warm. So between those two, I've been able to get it pretty good, but it still eats certain shades and I don't know what it is because it's fine in the front facing view. And I keep thinking, it's like, oh, look, it has shimmer. And I'm like, no, remember self, you just cleaned it out of diamine red luster last night. You haven't had a chance to ink it up with anything else. So even though you got most of the residual shimmer out, there's still going to be some. Though the traces of gold shimmer do really well in this. It looks really pretty. But I would be willing to bet that Pelican is not going to touch shimmer ink, especially in their high-end line, i.e. Edelstein, with a 100-foot pole. Put, shimmer ink just seems so un-Pelican.
even though they have some really pretty like shimmery sparkly lustery pens but no though they did they did put sparkle in the actual pen the petals pelican um 200 was it a 205 or 200 star ruby pen actually is this color but with shimmer sparkles in the plastic resin the same thing um yeah and this ink continues to be lusciously wet like i said my my perceptions are a little bit off though because i have been using pretty much only sparkle inks for the last six weeks, at least in terms of ink reviews, where I've been paying attention to it. And because of the sparkle, they do tend not, they don't tend to be drier. They just tend to clog and cause more feed problems. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, yeah, Pelican is probably like, mm. But at the same time, like I said, they put the sparkles in the in the M205. So, but it's just the ink. I don't know. I can't see them doing it for their ink line. But, like, they can't control what we do. Probably if you sent it in for repair, they would be like, what, what the fuck? Why are there sparkles in this feed? There, there has to be someone at Pelican that does like sparkle because they got that through in the actual pen. There's probably someone that's been in the market or art department, whatever department that is. I don't know pen company corporate structure. That's just been lobbying real hard for the sparkles. And they gave them the sparkle pen. And they have been doing more bright color pelicans as of like, say that turquoise and white one, the purple and white one, which seem more removed from their very business business, I don't know, mood. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, there, there does have to be a nail polish that matches that. You have a much more extensive nail polish collection than me. I shall task you with matching that. I shall also ask Audrey if she has time. Between the two of you, one of you has to have something that matches. Audrey, for those of you who don't know, is Audrey Madison. AKA the Nib Doctor. AK right on the nail. She is Franklin Kristoff's in-house Nibmeister. Also a literal doctor, like PhD doctor, hence the name. And she's also a nail pol a very avid nail polish blogger. So confluence of all the things. Um, you can't see the sheen as much on the Kukuyo, but that's normal. Um, there's some very pretty shading. I know a lot of people are really liking this ink. It is not doing it for me. Like, I see objectively that it's very pretty. At the same time, I'm just very meh on it. I don't know, even though, like, so look at these, like, these two. I have a bottle of this. I really like this ink. 
Yet this, which is very, 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 very similar, not doing anything for me. I have no idea. I know that this one is slightly more pink than this. Maybe that's what is doing it. Personal preference and ink choice is the wildest thing. Okay. Hello, hello, more people. Okay, and you can see these are two inks. I did this one last week. This one I did on Tuesday. Like I said, I'm starting new gig substitute teaching. Substitute teaching is real boring. So I that's why I have all my ink review stuff in a linear. Because I just throw, the, I just take this with me and then write an ink review while supervising kids I mean, it's high school, and I recognize my authority as a sub and my place in that pecking order. Like, some of them do the work, some of them take it as a free period. I'm just like, just just be chill. I understand that it's a sub and that only some of you are going to do the work. Just like, don't break anything. And I do an ink review. And it only takes me like one class period. But I don't want to, like, there's not usually availability for me to clean a pen in the middle of a class, unless it's a science classroom. So maybe I could plan it like that, where I get a bunch done when I'm in a science classroom, because there are the lab sinks there, but that just seems like a bad idea to be cleaning pens and have pens just assembled around a bunch of high schoolers. And if you are wondering, that was indeed me that sent that into the pen addict about letter writing getting purple ink all over my hands. I will never fill an ink in a classroom again because of that. I now make sure to get everything filled and ready to go the night before. Because I do not want to repeat up that incident. Okay. Now, if we only we could get Lamy to do a sparkly Lamy 2000, that would be amazing. It'll cost like a million dollars because Lamy. But the fact that they would, but the fact that it would exist would be worth it. If they need some serious crossover in their departments because like the safari team, the AL team and the studio team have been absolutely killing it. But then like the rest of it, it's just like, eh? Also, I want to acknowledge all the other Lamy pens, like the CP1 and the logo. And there's, they've, they've got all these other pens that I really like, um, at the Pelican hub app, actually one of the, uh, my local pen friends that I only see at meets like that because I always forget to hang out with people outside of established events. He has basically a whole, like, he really likes Lamy. He has, basically has one of each of their pens. And it's just like, I forget which one, the CP1 or the logo is basically like a skinny Lamy 2000. And it's great. I love you. I love using it. I love using the logo. It really fits me. And they just are, and they're great. I kind of wish they came out in more colors, but I don't know. It seems like Lamy has directed all its fun, colorful stuff towards like the studio and the to that and the safari and the AL start. Everything else is very like industrial German. Yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm looking at this pen and I'm like, or this pen, this ink, and I'm like, objectively, it's pretty. It's doing nothing for me. Which honestly does not surprise me because I felt the same way about Colorverse Redshift when I did that. Like, very close. I was like, it, like, I can see it looks pretty, 
but it's just no. Which is, like I said, love this ink, even though it behaves like pants. Mike, I stole your term. Um, yeah, I don't know. Okay, but now comes the fun part. So you need people watching. In addition to doing it in a couple, doing my reviews on a couple different papers, like good papers, I also do it on shitty paper. So this is a Staples generic notebook. I think my parents bought it for me during one of those back to school sales where the pay, where the notebooks are literally a penny. So we are talking shit, real generic, American cheap paper. And you could like, it's like, oh look, that's good performance. Um, yeah. But this is very helpful because sometimes you don't have any choice but to use stuff like this. Um, I can think of Aiden is in college now, but he used to join for these things. And when he was in high school, he had, you know, teachers that very strictly wanted eight and a half by 11 letter size, which is very hard to find in good paper because that, because good paper is mo pretty much all international or uses international sizing. So that American letter size is, it's just a hard hunt. So he just had one of these and he was like, oh, that's the bait of my existence. I'm like, well, congratulations. I could tell you what ink to use on it. The answer is platinum, is the platinum classics line, by the way. If you want fun colors that actually behave decently on this paper, Pelican, or not Pelican, Platinum Classics. Surprisingly good. Really stupidly dry inks, but solid performance on shit paper. And then do bear in mind that I am using fines so I cannot guarantee that good performance with that ink if you use like a broad or something. But as part of what my point of these ink reviews is to demonstrate, nib size ain't everything. Flow is a big deal too. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, back to that, Raul. If only we can get Lamy to do a Sparkle Sparkle 2000. That would just, that would be a minor miracle. I just, like, this is the dry pen. This is not. Yeah, this one always performs the best on this shit paper because it's a dry pen. So there's literally not as much ink going down on the page. Where was I in the article? I really wish, wish there was a fun article in the paper today for me to copy for you guys, which that's what I usually try and do. It's either something like I legit want to read the article and see what it says. Usually those are serious business articles. But if I can get a fun, dumb local news story, I try to. Like, where will probably remember is when we, um, the one about the lobster. There's the one about the, the like, pie colored lobster or something that was coming to the Georgia Aquarium. That was a great article. There was also the one about an, a, a, like a garden store that had like several thousand dollars worth of fish stolen from it. That was great. There was one about the really pissed off neighborhood that were aghast that people went 35 miles an hour through their neighborhood. Oh no. Even though the neighborhood street they were pissed about.
to lift everything out. And it was an old lady swallow the fly situation. And it was beautiful. And you could, and the way the person who wrote it, they were like, yep, we're just, let's go deadpan humor with this one. And it was, like I said, very perfect. And then, oh, this pen has such a satisfying snap. Yeah, this pen is given, was just like, we're gonna leap down. The bathroom drain. Yeah, I don't know. I don't... It seems everything looks fine on my end. It looks excellent, so I don't know. But it was... The internet was giving me problems earlier. Basically, when I started up the stream, it was unhappy. I don't know if my internet just was not used to the fact that I was, because I haven't streamed in a couple weeks. And so it was unhappy with me, but then it, it sorted itself out. And I found out the reason why my internet is probably very spotty is because the internet relay is just like a cable sitting out in the open on the bottom of the crawl space under my apartment. It's just like an exposed cable, just like laying down there, you could totally be submerged in water, you know, whenever there's a storm, it's fine. Or whenever anyone's getting something out of the crawl space, it often gets tangled in the stuff. Yeah, I think it was because, like I, like I said, I'm not seeing anything. I see no notifications whatsoever. Um, but yeah. So that's going to be about it for this ink. Feathering is not as bad as I expected based off of how wet this pen is. No, the ink is normally when the inks are this gushy, it tends to be real bad on the shit paper, diatramentus being a prime example of it. Damn it. Never use diatramentus on shit paper. It'll just obliterate it. It's real bad. Just a comical effect. Yeah, I was expecting worse. The white pen's shit, but it usually is. There's very few inks that stand up to the wet pen on the shit paper. This is passable? I've seen better. But it's, it's definitely far from the worst that I've seen. Okay. what happens when I haven't done this in a while well no that's not true I've done the actual reviews I just haven't streamed it so I should remember all my counts in my lines and everything it's very specific so I make sure to maximize the amount of pa space on the page that I'm using cool so okay so what's gonna happen now Again, for those of you who are new here, is that I am going to clean out these pens, which I'll just start emptying them here. And then I will actually go clean them at my bathroom sink. In the past, I have actually brought out the cleaning stuff here on the actual, you know, bench and everything. And it's just, it's a hassle and it takes a lot longer. So I just opt to 
you know, do it real quick at the sink. Maybe it takes 10, 15 minutes, depending on how sticky the inks are. And then I'll be back with, um, oh, look at that. That's lovely. Um, Lamy Copper Orange, which I am super excited about. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you more about how that made its way to me when I get there, but it's just, I have really nice friends is what it comes down to. Because they hauled ass for me to get that ink. Or at least a bottle of that ink. Because I have cartridges of it and I have a sample of it. But it's just, it's one of those where I'm just like, I need a bottle. Please. Okay. So I'm going to go clean these in the bathroom sink. And we'll be back with Lonnie Copper Orange. See you in about 10-15 minutes.
Hello, hello, hello. We're back. So I decided to just go ahead and fill the pens just while I was drying them because that always is like a weird part of the stream. So now we have this beautiful baby, Lummy Copper Orange. Yes, that is a bottle. This is newly acquired by me. So for those of you who don't know, Lamy Copper Orange was the 2015 Lamy Limited Edition ink. I guess they were actually, there was a while there, basically up until only a couple years ago when Lamy was doing two limited edition inks per year. And the last couple years, they've decided to just make it one. Um, so this is the year before Dark Lilac, which I also have a bottle of. And this was right before, like right when I was really getting deep into fountain pens. I've been in fountain pens since I was 16. Like I've known, like I've been using them, but I didn't realize basically what happened was I was 16. I went to go look at information on the internet, found that there was information, but the community wasn't really there. And so I wrote it off. And then of course, only a few years later, the online community really started to take off, but I already had already written it off, it, written that online community off. So I didn't rediscover it until like 2014. And so I was getting deep, it, I was starting to get into it when this came out. I, rec I recognized it was a limited ink and that it was new, but I had no concept of how quickly these things sold out. And so I ordered a sample of it. I really liked it. But by the time I got around to ordering and using the sample, bottles had been long since sold out. So I have wanted a bottle. I just barely missed being able to get a bottle of this and I have wanted it ever since. So that's four years of wanting. And then I'm trying to look for my cartridges because someone did give me, there they are. Um, like last year or so they had some cartridges of Lamy Copper Orange and I was like, yes, please, I will take them. Cause like if you Google or like search on eBay for Lamy Copper Orange, you can't find bottles of it. You can find cartridges. So I took the cartridges, but unlike Dark Lilac and Petrol, which were the hotness inks, especially Dark Lilac, where you can find them on eBay, they're just mucho expensive. It's just Lamy Copper Orange slid past people's radar. It was right before that. So you can't even find bottles on eBay because people aren't even just like putting the bottles out there to sell. And so it wasn't even a question of, oh, it's expensive. I don't want to spend the money. It was a que It was just like, I, I can't even obtain it. So what I, so what ended up happening was that Anna Inca and Tadora, she also has a blog and a really good Instagram. And she's on the FPC Inc podcast was in Mexico for a work trip. And she found two bottles in a local shop. This is a Mexican, so this, so we're tracking this ink internationally now. It has gone from Germany to Mexico for the original shipment. She bought both bottles. She lives in France. So she went back home to Paris and then posted on the pen addict Slack. Oh, I have these two bottles. And then I commented, that's amazing. Like, good for you. I've always wanted a bottle of that ink. I will continue. Hopefully I will be as lucky as you one day and stumble upon a bottle. She is a friend of mine. She DM'd me being like, hey, I have two bottles. Do you want to buy one of them? And I was like, fuck, yes, I do. And so, yeah, I bought it. But like I said, she lives in France. Spending that much money to ship this bottle ink could be done. Didn't really want to risk like, but she was like, hey, I'm going to be at the San Francisco Pen Show in August. I will just deliver it to you there. Now, I did tell her at the time that I probably wasn't going to San Francisco, but I don't think she heard me. It just like flew over her head. And so she then flies to San Francisco. So this ink has gone Germany, Mexico, Paris, San Francisco. Then, so what happened is I secured a mule at San Francisco because I asked Anna, I was like, I'm not going to this show. Do you have time to make it to a post office to mail it in San Francisco? She did not because she was, you know, being a tourist. Going to the post office is the last thing on her mind. So I secured a mule. My friend Sandra muled it for, was able to, uh, got the handoff from Anna to Sandra. Sandra lives in North Carolina. So the ink went in her suitcase from San Francisco to North Carolina. And then a couple weeks later, cause like 
That was also when a hurricane was hitting and Sandra works for an insurance agency that deals with hurricanes. So she got swamped at work. So it sat in her house for a few weeks. Totally cool. Then she finally shipped it to me and it got to me. So this ink went from Germany to Mexico, sat in a shop in Mexico for like four years, got bought, went to Paris, to San Francisco, to North Carolina, to me in Atlanta. And I finally have it. I love this ink. Like I said, I've used samples of it and cartridges of it. And now I have a bottle. It's my precious. And you will take it from my cold dead hands. So let's write a review of it. <laughs> this is one of those, this is, like I said, this is, eventually I'm going to do reviews of all my inks. And like I said, I have a bottle of dark lilac. I bought it when it originally came out because that was the year after this. And so I knew, get on that shit and buy it. Um, so I have a bottle of that. So we're going to do a review of that. And that's going to be fun. Cause I'll be like, here, here's this highly coveted ink you can't get, but like I said, you can get dark lilac. You just got to pay up the wazoo for it. This is hard to get. Um, so let's look at the swab and this, I think the other reason this flew under people's radar because people were like, oh, it's just an orange. There's something, there's like a pinky quality to it. Yes, it is very much a traveler ink. I don't know, I really, so this is Lamy Copper Orange. It is, it's, I have it right here between Diving Autumn Oak and California Aurora. So these are both oranges that have a, these are all oranges that have a slight pinky quality to it. Um, I actually really don't like Diamine Autumn Oak. For some, the way it shades and the letters form looks really weird to me and freaks me out a little bit. I have a bottle of Aurora. So I clearly like these pinky, like, it's almost corals. Like, I would call California Aurora a coral. I would not call Lamy Copper Orange a coral. It is an orange with pink undertones. It has a sheen. It has, like I was talking about with Lamy Vibrant Pink, it has that very subtle shimmer to it. That's like, it's not a shimmer ink by any means. It has some shimmer and the shimmer is more as flakes than a shimmer. I love it. It's gorgeous. Don't know if you can see the shimmers. The shimmer isn't as strong in the copper orange as it is in the vibrant pink. So it doesn't, you can't see it nesting on the bottom of the bottle as well. But it's, it's such a unique shade of orange. I really like orange ink. I have a lot of orange inks. Um, that because it's got that pink undertone, it's just. So I am not one to call things grails lightly because I'm of the opinion that not only like a grail should either be so obscenely monetarily expensive that you have to literally save for years in order to buy it. So for some people, this could be one of those like, like a chaos pen or something stupidly expensive like that. Or it's, it should be more really hard to find. Like it should be like a holy grail quest to obtain it. So some of the original like Naginata Todi, Togi's, like Naginata's for Nagahara Senior, or some of those like real, like King Cobra, some of those real bonkers sailor nibs, those are hard to come by. Those count as grails to me. The fact that I had to track this down and it crossed the ocean like three times and went through a bunch of different people, I would count this as a grail. <laughs> Like, I wouldn't count something even like, I read Schaefer Peacock a couple month, months ago, Schaefer Peacock Blue. That's a vintage ink. It's been long since discontinued. Um, but, you know, you can still buy it on eBay really easily. I don't count that as real. I just count that as vintage. So, yes, this shit. Okay, let's actually write with it. Like I said, ironically, even though, like, it's like, I finally have a bottle. I've used this ink a bunch before with the samples and the and the cartridges. So I know how it writes, hence why I wanted it so badly. Okay. And I honestly don't think that you should probably should spend that much effort tracking down a pen or an ink like that, unless you, you really know what you're getting into because otherwise that's a giant letdown. If you put all this effort into obtaining this thing and then you've like built up the hype and you've never used it before, you've like built up the hype in your mind. And that that's just a recipe for giant letdown. Like I said, this is something I'd used before. I already knew about, I knew I liked it. So it's just huge payoff. Okay. 
And like I said, big, huge, gigantic thank you to Anna, Encantadora, and Sandra, WF Cupcake Girl. Aces. Just, you guys are the best. Like, and I know it probably seems like, oh, Sandra didn't do that much compared to Anna, but like, she's the one who got it to me eventually. She did as much of the traveling. Also, I've like stayed at our house for pen shows, so I feel like I also owe her for like providing me free lodging. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's where, that was a fun, fun little house party at her house for Triangle Pen Show. Cause she lives like 30 minutes from the venue. It's like me with the Atlanta Pen Show. It's just like, technically I live in Atlanta, but the Atlanta Pen Show is like, on the other side of town, so it takes me half an hour to get there because the Atlanta metro area is huge. So yeah, that was chill. Yes, fun secret doors. They're really secret doors? So Sandra's, Sandra's house layout is really weird. She likes it. Good for her. Her house, she should like it. But it's got like, like the floor plan and where carpeting ends and stops is like, her laundry is on the second floor attached to like a living room. And she has a bath and her, she has like a half third floor with like a craft room and a little office thing that she doesn't use. And there's a bathroom up there and there's a little door in the bathroom that's like maybe a foot and a half, two feet tall square. And it's just like in the wall of the bathroom. And I'm like, what the fuck is this secret door? So I open it and I found all our Christmas decorations. And it's just like, okay. <laughs> I don't know why I went with this one. I'm still doing, yeah. I love Sandra though. I really do. She's great. Where are they? Now we're going back to the article. And I don't know where the hell I was in the article. Okay, there we are. Luckily, it ended cop in the middle of a date, so that was very easy to find. Just had to look for numbers. But yeah, I really owe Anna something. And I haven't met her in person. Like, I've talked to her a bunch. Like, I've talked to her on the phone. I've, like, walked her through how to use a pH meter. Because she's a real, she is a big, big ink person. Like, that's her thing. And her thing is she loves collecting brands of ink. So she, her goal is to get, like, try as many new brands as possible. She's by far the leader on fpc.ink for a number of brands with good reason. If there's an, obs if you come across an obscure brand of ink, Anna probably knows about it. She's the one to ask. And so her being a big ink person, uh, she wanted to like actually test the pH of inks. So she bought like an aquarium pH meter on Amazon because you can't use pH paper for inks because pH paper relies on color changing to tell the pH, which obviously if you're dipping that in ink is moot because you're coloring the paper. So you need an electronic pH meter. So she bought like a cheap one for aquariums but then had no idea how to actually calibrate it. And the instructions were unclear. So me having a science background, walked her through the process. And like, we've become good friends since then. I say good friends because I'm really bad at maintaining friendships. So we've talked several times back and forth, which is a lot for me. Like I'm, I'm so terrible at maintaining friendships. But I haven't met her, so I really want to meet her in person at one time. And I was bummed I didn't get to meet her at the San Francisco Pen Show, but there was no way I could go this year. I could not afford that. It was, I knew it was going to be expensive last year and it was more expensive than I anticipated. And I definitely could not afford that this year. Eventually I want to go back. 
But the problem with the San Francisco Pen Show is that I live on the East Coast. So it's like a six hour plane ride. Granted, how I've like I, I my flight there and back were different and I enjoy it was fine when I was coming back because I basically did like three hours tra- change planes in Phoenix and then four hours. So that breakup of the flights was real nice. But it's still you lose like a whole day going there and back. And on I'm and honestly, if I'm gonna travel that much, I'd rather go to Europe. It's the same distance away in terms of plane travel as the West Coast. So I mean flights are more expensive, but like so the point is if I'm gonna spend like if I'm gonna burn a whole day going there, I wanna spend like a week there. Not just go there for the pen show and leave. Um, San Francisco is a very expensive area and I cannot afford to stay there for a week. I can barely afford to stay there for a couple days for a pen show. So we're going to park San Francisco as a pen show until I am more financially stable and can afford to vacation there for a week that happens to include a pen show. Because I did feel real bummed that I was there and I only saw basically the Pen Show Hotel and I'm like, there's so much cool shit in San Francisco and I'm not seeing it. Uh. Yeah, because for you, because you're in Colorado, Raul. That's so far away. So you might as well make a vacation out of it. Now, I don't want to go to the DC Pen Show because it seems like it's so huge. It would just be overwhelming to me. It's so, And it's also always over my birthday weekend. And to be honest, I would rather do other things than fly to DC, the suburbs of DC for a pen show for my birthday. But yeah, it's just, it just seems too clusterfucky for me. Though I could easily do DC as a pen show because it's a good time of year. I have a lot of family that lives in DC and a lot of friends that live in DC that I could easily crash with. So it would be very cheap for me to do it. It just... Nothing about the DC show has ever seemed appealing to me. Because everyone that I can see at the DC pen show, I can see at other pen shows. For the most part. Like... A lot of the locals all go to the Baltimore show as well, because that's so close. And I really like the Baltimore show. Um, it's it's smaller. It's more controlled. It doesn't have that chaos. It's much better run. I will say my liking of the Baltimore Penn show is definitely contingent on the fact that last time I went, it was located in downtown Baltimore. It was a little blip where they tried it in downtown Baltimore and then they went back to the airport to hotel. And the fact that I could walk around the city a little bit instead of just being stuck in the show hotel really contributed to how much I liked the show. So because it's back at the airport, I'm not sure I would like the show as much. That's something I've learned is that I need to be able to easily get outside the show hotel in order for me to like traveling to a show, which is why I like Triangle so much because I drove so I wasn't stuck. Yeah, everyone does talk up Baltimore. Like I said, it was a great show when I went two years ago. But there were other factors contributing to it. Like I said, the location, because it was downtown, I could easily like go find cool things to eat. It was also my first time really meeting people and hanging out with people since I really got involved in the pen community. Like, 
I'd been to the Atlanta show a couple times, but I didn't really know people besides like a few of my knitting friends. And I like met people at the Atlanta Pen Show in 2017. Like I met Robo Jim there. I met Claire written in Rice there that have now become my friends. But at the time I was just freshly meeting them versus the Baltimore Pen Show in 2018. I was meeting all these people that I had become very good friends with online in person for the first time. And that was an amazing experience. It was a good location. It was a really fun show with a lot of shenanigans. That was before Piff like jumped off a cliff. Um, so that was really cool. We, I was in the middle of podcasting at that time and it was just magic happened. So I think if I went back, I'd be really disappointed because like it wouldn't be like that one time. But I definitely want to try and get there this year because if you do not listen to the Erasable podcast, the Erasable podcast is the pencil podcast. Um, the show organizers. So one of the hosts lives in Baltimore. And the Baltimore Pen Show, and he's gone to the Baltimore Pen Show the last couple of years. The show organizers at the Baltimore Pen Show have offered them a space to do a live show. The hosts have never met each other in person. Like they've met, a couple of them have met each other, but they've never all been in the same room together ever. They've been podcasting for over five years. I want them to meet each other. I would definitely throw money at a Kickstarter campaign or something similar. And I want to see them all together at once. Because I've met two of them. I haven't met all three of them, but it's just, that would be the driving reason for me to go to Baltimore this year is if that happened. Otherwise, I'm with you. I'd really want to go to Chicago. Chicago looks like a bomb show. And I haven't been able to go because the timing is really bad for me. Because I'm tied to the academic schedule. It's right before AP exams, which is my busiest time of year by a lot. And I just can't, like, that is just, no, I can't really be out of town at that time. I can't really take off work at that time, unless I get a new job. But yeah, so basically I can't go to Chicago Pen Show until I get a new job that isn't completely dependent on the academic schedule, the academic calendar. But I really want to. I also really want to go to Philly because Philly seems like a cool show. The problem with Philly is that it's right after Christmas and that shouldn't be an issue for most people, except I'm from New Jersey. I will have just flown, like I will have just spent basically a week in New Jersey, like an hour and a half away from Philly, like two weeks prior to the show. It would feel real stupid to fly all the way back two weeks later. Also, it would be, It would feel really weird to be literally an hour and a half away from my parents and not visit them. Even though I would have just seen them. And I would probably feel obligated to crash with my parents, even though that's like, like I said, an hour and a half away. That's not exactly reasonable. But like, and also like apparently parking at the hotel is really expensive. So I might as well just stay at the hotel. I don't know. It's weird. Maybe one day I'll do it and I'll be like, hey, parents, I'm going to be at the Philly Pen Show this weekend. I'm. get this ink. Um, it might not be for you. That's fair. 
There are a lot of inks people like that I don't like and vice versa. Like that Star Ruby. A lot of people really like that Star Ruby ink. And like I said, I objectively see that it's pretty. It does nothing for me. Um, yeah. Though I do need... So, speaking of pen shows, we seem to be... It is... The Atlanta show used to be like mid April. And then the last like three years, they've moved it up to the first weekend in April. Unfortunately, this directly conflicts with 221 Beacon. Two, I have been going to 221 Beacon since 2014. I fucking love that convention. Even though like none of us, like Sher BBC Sherlock is long gone. Like it's like. It's, yeah, like, it's basically done. And, like, I don't know, I just, like, have so many friends there that I see once a year. I love it. It is a really well-done convention, a small convention. It's great. I will prioritize that over the Atlanta Pen Show every single time. One of the main reasons for that being that the bar at the Atlanta Pen Show sucks. Um, so the After Dark scene is not good. Um, but, yeah. So therefore, like two years ago, I tried to do both at the same time. That was a clusterfuck. I ended up not going to either, essentially. I spent so little time at either. Last year, I went to 221 Beacon. This year, 221 Beacon, Land Pen Show at the same time again. So I'm basically like, don't have a local show. Well, I have a local show, but I have a local show I can never make it to. So I need to figure, so I'm like figuring out what my pen shows are going to be next year. Probably Triangle, because Triangle is a nice, easy drive away. But I'd like to figure out other options, not just triangle. Because while I love triangle, it is a teeny tiny show. Teach One Beacon is amazing. Encourage your friend to come. It's so good. I understand about cost and stuff though. If that's not feasible or schedules. Though it has sort of matured. So when 221 Beacon first was going on, that was like peak BBC Sherlock fandom. And so it was like nuts. I don't know what you know about Sherlock fans, but like they have a reputation and it's deserved for being just batshit in like weird ways. Um, this is true. BBC Sherlock is all over the place. And so, but in the last, like, year, it's, I don't know, last year, Duty One Beacon was way more chill than it has been in the past years, and it was nice. It was like, okay, cool. We're just basically, like, essentially all, like, Series 4 came out. The crazy people went really off the deep end and, like, just imploded and basically, ye and basically, like, yeeted off the from the fandom. And so all that were left were like the chill people. And so like that was who showed up at 221 Beacon last year. And it was real nice. And it was people that I've known for years. And it's just like, cool, we're just hanging out with our friends all weekend and being nerdy. Versus in op like in opposition to Dragon Con, which is just huge and giant and overwhelming. I should actually get to writing this review because I do have to sub in the morning. So in theory, I should be asleep in half an hour to get a full eight hours. But that's fine. I also need to, I have a Halloween party on Saturday. I don't know what the fuck I'm going to be. People throw, throw good closet costume ideas at me because that's, the level I'm at right now, like, hey, go go thrift shopping. But I don't know what's going to be there. And I just haven't been able to get myself to a thrift store. Uh, 
Oh, that's really sad. Okay, but yeah, but anyway. So. I've already, I also have like a leather jacket in my closet that I've used for both Ninth Doctor and Jessica Jones cosplays. Cosplays cost costumes. So I've done those for Halloween before. So I'm really not sure. And then if you're wondering about the performance of this ink in terms of wetness, dryness, it's like pretty much all Lamy nibs or Lamy inks, not too wet, not too dry. It's just good. What do you mean by medium? Where the media... Not medium, medium, median. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Um, which script? So, like, the only one I've really used is the red. And I've used, I've used peacock blue as well because peacock blue but that's a vintage ink and there's it's just down the middle yeah like it's like like the performance is good it is standard it doesn't have a lot of it doesn't have shade like it does depending on the ink it does have shading but it doesn't have sheen it doesn't have it's not super wet it's not super dry it's just it's good some of the colors leave a lot to be desired but i really like the red the red is very solid. 
And I like the peacock blue. And, and the turquoise is really good too. But it's just, it's solid. And that's how it is for a lot of the pen company inks. Like your regular old Lamy inks. They're solid. Waterman inks, they're solid. The colors leave a lot to be desired sometimes. Like the only real issues I tend to have with like pen company inks tends to be a lot of their standard lineup colors are weird. Like a lot of the time the blacks will be like weirdly watered out or the reds will be pinky, which is why Schaefer red is such an exception because it's an actual red. Mm. And like I said, a lot of the times the blacks will be washed out, but like Lamy Black is a great black. It's a good black. Yeah, a lot of the greens for pen companies tend to be like, like almost blue greens and they're weak and I just, just don't like them. But like your regular old pilots, not your pilot Orochizuka, but like your regular old pilot inks, they're fine. They're just fine. Same with the regular old sailor, not the sailor gentle or anything, just the regular sailor, it's fine. Parker inks, it's fine. The only exception I can think of actually is Pelican, the 4001 series. I haven't ever actually used them, but I hear they are so dry. Like that they're so, so dry. This is probably because Pelican pens are so wet. They balance each other out. But yeah, that's the only one exception I can think of of a pen company ink of like their standard line that is anything less than fine. For, like I said, for their like standard lines, because the platinum, cla the platinum classics, the iron gall ones, those are really dry, but those aren't your standards. They're special ones. I'm just like, like when this came out, I think the general consent, when this ink came out, the general consensus was it's an orange. It's fine. It is so different from the other oranges I have in my collection. Like, yes, it's orange, but it's, it's like got a pink undertone. It's got like some sort of like weird, like brown going on there too, where it's just, it, there's something different about it. That's why I'm really, and I haven't been able to find that in any of their ink, hence the hunt for it. And now we're going to look at what it sees, does on shit paper because I genuinely, this is the one area where I genuinely have no idea about its performance because I haven't used it on shit paper. That's a lie. I did use it on shit paper. I used it on shit paper a lot when I was studying for the, um, like the subject exams for Georgia teachers. One of my many career paths that I've tried down in the last two years has been to try and get my teacher certification. And I was trying to do the alternate path certification, which required I passed the content exam before applying to the program. So I did that in April and it was basically all of high school science. Now I can do that. It's just been a while. So I've spent like 
two weeks, just every waking moment going through basically all my college textbooks, because it's better to be over prepared, right? Biology, geology, meteorology, oceanography, chemistry, physics. Definitely overkilled for the test. I was given three hours to do it. I finished it in an hour and I got a perfect score. But while I was studying, I was using an old shitty notebook because I knew I was going to be burning through paper and Lamy copper orange cartridges. I used an entire pack of cartridge cartridges taking those notes. Fun times. But it was fine. It was fine on cheap paper. Now, because it was the cartridges, I used it in my Lamy Vista, which is my old reliable. That is the pen that I got when I was 16 and I still have it. It's still my workhorse. But I don't know what it's like in these pens on shit paper, so we'll see. Anyone still have any Halloween, like closet Halloween costume ideas? Even if it's a stupid pun, I love, generally I'm not a fan of puns, but dumb visual puns like Chris Pine, I'm all about those for Halloween costumes. Where was I in? Yep, fair. Yeah, no, like, I was invited to this Halloween party weeks ago, and I was very aware I needed a costume for it, and I just kept putting it off, kept putting it off, and I was like, I'll make it to a thrift store eventually, and then I'm like, shit, I was gonna go either today or yesterday, and just, these are the first more chill days I've had in a while where I could just, like, be, and I was like, I'm not doing fucking errands on these days, and so I didn't, because thrift store counts as errands. Like, I didn't have to leave the house today. That is the first time in a very long time I have not had to leave the house. Unless you count doing laundry, because the laundry in my apartment is in a different building. That is technically leaving my apartment. Yay, okay, we've reconnected. That was definitely my internet being a dumbass. Um, yeah. Team of... I'm really thinking of, like, I don't know, just going to Target and buying... Because you know they already have the Christmas decorations in stock, or at least Michael's does. Getting some fake pine stuff. Maybe they have a corny Christmas hat. And like I said, putting Christmas tree stuff, adorning myself hanging a sign around my neck that says Chris and being Chris Pine. Like I said, I still have to make it to the store. But that's that's doable. And like I said, if I can get something that can actually also double as Christmas decorations, like legit, 
That would be great. Team, uh, there we are. Absolute worst case scenario. I do have some sweaters that I knit for that are like Sherlock sweaters. So they're like cosplay sweaters. I don't have the rest of the outfit for the cosplay. It would basically be just me wearing a sweater, but it's like halfway a costume. It would also be really fucking hot because it would be a party full a house full of people. in Georgia where it is probably going to be in the 70s. Actually, the what that's in 2 days. I can actually check the in, the weather for that. But yeah. So, look at the back. Again, not terrible. Like I said, these two pens is fine. It's passable. This needs work, but it's by far not the worst I've ever seen. Like I said, it's a rare pen that doesn't obliterate, or it's a rare ink that doesn't obliterate this paper in the wet pen. Mmm. I did do a really cheap Molly Hooper cosplay, like first 2 to 1 Beacon. I borrowed a lab coat from the office, from the lab that I never, I don't think I should return because it didn't have any nasty stuff on it because it was a disposable one. So I could do that. I don't really, like, I, like, it's a weird Molly Hooper cosplay because I, like, don't have any of the other, like, obvious Molly Hooper stuff. It would just be, like, me in a lab coat. And this party is among, like, my grad school friends, so they would just be really confused. Um, I did one year do a choice Zoiberg costume. I knit myself like a face mask with like the Zoiberg and had to use that lab coat. And it was amazing. It was great. Cause I also have like these lobster oven mitts. So I wore those like, no, like, but I already did that. I already did that here. That's the problem is that like, I've been here long enough that like, I'm running out of like closet cheap ideas and I'm like, oh no. And it's like the same friend group. So I'm like, mm, still need to work on it. You know what I could do? My parent, this would be slightly offensive, but my parents, when they were young, got plastic, tr clear plastic trash bags, filled up the plastic trash bags with like recycling and clean trash. And they were white trash, which I always thought was brilliant. I don't know if I can get my hands on that much like tolerable garbage before then though, or clear trash bags. Um, yeah, so that was Lamy Copper Orange and that was, so I'm working it. Like I said, I think my default is I'm gonna go to Michael's or something tomorrow and see what I can um, scrounge up. Or I'll hit the thrift stores first because thrift stores I feel like perpetually have like old Christmas decorations. So if I can find some trim, I might have some trim in my Christmas decorations that actually that I like just never put out. I have to look for that. Or if I get really desperate, I can make a hat that's pine tree out of construction paper and just be a spectacularly shitty costume. What I did want to do, like when I thought of this like weeks ago and I just haven't acted on it, I was like, oh, I'll find like a piece of pine wood and write Chris on it. And that'll be my costume. But yeah. So yeah. Thank you for joining me. I do not know when I will n n be able to do one of these next. Um, definitely not next week. Because next week is Halloween. So yeah. That's going to be a... If I ever do have mythical trick-or-treaters. But like no one's going to be around. Um, maybe the week after that. Like I'll, I'll let you know. I might be able to like... I might at points be able to do these reviews, not on Thursdays, but sporadically other days of the week, depending on what I have going on. So like I know in a couple weeks, I have an appointment that will, again, another appointment that will allow, that means I can't sub that day. So I might be able to do a review that day. 
I have jury duty coming up soon. Depending on how jury duty goes, they might dismiss me. And I might have the whole afternoon free. So maybe we'll do an ink review that day. It all depends. It's we're playing it very fast and loose here. I still like doing these clearly. It's just been a timing thing. So just keep your eye out on that notification. I know schedules are better, but this is this is the best I can do right now. Anyway, I will see you later. Like I said, I need to get up at 4.30 in the morning and tomorrow, and it is currently 8.22, so I need to actually start going to bed. It's dumb. Um, but yeah, um, thank you for joining me, and I will see you later. Also, if you are still looking for content, I am still, just before we go, I am still writing blog posts. So those are still posting. I'm still writing reviews, just not necessarily on the stream. So if you want to see new inks, um, there's that link down there under the chat box. And there's also should be a link in the info area of this Twitch stream to my blog. You can find the actual written ink reviews there if you want to see the scans and blow up all the details real big if you saw an ink here that you were interested in. Interested in. Um, yeah. So yeah, I will see you at some point. Bye.